Coming up on DTNS, G4 is apparently back. India is making more iPhones. And Patrick Norton lets us know how bad the Intel news is. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, July 24th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, as I mentioned, host of AVXL, Patrick Norton. How's it going, Patrick? Patrick? Oh. Patrick, you're, you've muted yourself on Skype. That's a or, first. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe Skype didn't want you. They didn't want the truth to come out. Uh, how's yeah. it going, man? I, you know, outside of this whole Blue Jays, Buffalo, Bison, hat thing, <laughs> I'm golden. Um, excellent, excellent. Uh, well, we were just uh, talking about a, uh, a show called Alone on the History Channel, uh, and you need to get the dramatic retelling from Len Peralta by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS and getting good day internet. Let's start here with a few tech things you should know. Not that one, this one. Two former Twitter employees tell Reuters that more than a thousand employees of Twitter and contractors had access to internal tools as of early 2020 and could change user account settings and hand control to others, including contractors like Cognizant that work with Twitter. Twitter says it's seeking a new head of security, working to better secure its systems and train employees on resisting tricks from outsiders in the future. The Verge's sources say the Monday hearing of the U.S. House Judiciary Committee, the assembling of the Avengers, Mark Zuckerberg, Sundar Pichai, Jeff Bezos, and Tim Cook, will be postponed. It's like it's a Hollywood movie. A private memorial and public viewing of U.S. Representative and Civil Rights Leader John Lewis is scheduled for Monday, and that would start just after this hearing was originally scheduled, so people are like, you're probably not going to want to go straight from one end to the other. Uh, this hearing, whenever it happens, is supposed to mark the end of an investigation by the U.S. Congress into allegations of anti-competitive behavior by these companies. An update to the Samsung Galaxy Buds companion app points to an official Galaxy Buds live name and support for active noise cancellation, as well as a how to wear the earbuds with apparent touch controls. When Future reports that the price will be $169 with 4.5 hours of estimated battery life, three mics, and 12 nanometer drivers. Hmm. The National Basketball Association, the NBA, is using Microsoft Teams' new Together mode to create a virtual experience for fans during live games using AI to segment your face and your shoulder and recreate the appearance of being in the venue. Fans will be able to watch a live feed of the game within Teams, select fans anyway, and see other fans at the same time, and the players will hear them cheer, and it sounds kind of fun, actually. An outage that began Thursday affected Garmin's website. We talked about it a little bit on the show yesterday. Call centers were affected as well. Data syncing services, aviation databases, and production lines in Asia. Caitlin Simpanyu at ZDNet reports that it may have been caused by the Wasted Locker ransomware. While services are still out, users can't sync their fitness data from devices Pilots also, notably, unable to do FAA-required updates to flight databases on their navigation devices. And uh, as I've been doing, uh, some vaccine updates as news becomes available. Two of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines that are in Phase 3 trials, remember Phase 3 is the last step before you can actually use it on the public in general, have received updates. Sinovax vaccine, which uses an inactivated virus, has received approval to conduct part of its phase three trial with 9,000 people in Brazil, so expanding that phase three trial. And a vaccine from China National Biotech and Sinopharm have started phase three trials in Saudi Arabia. All right, let's talk a little more about that weird G4 news. Oh, let's. <laughs> <laughs> and it was weird. On Friday, the Twitter accounts of G4TV, Attack of the Show, and also Xplay all posted the same video of what looks like an, a pan in studio. The camera kind of zooms among wooden crates, lands on a screen playing Pong, then the screen is taken over by the words incoming transmission and is blurred and then lands on a G4 logo and then fades to the number 2021 and the words uh, the words, rather, we never stopped playing, which is 
supposed to indicate that G4 is coming back. The G4TV.com website shows a playable Pong game, which is that harkens back to a, you know, it's sort of like a ha-ha thing from the past. Um, G4 shut down on November of 2014. Adam Sessler, Morgan Webb, and Olivia Munn all responded to the tweet with apparent surprise. <laughs> As Although, did I. Not yeah. that you know we. Uh, I, the apparent surprise. I think. Um, I think is, it. It depends on who's being surprised. I truly was surprised. <laughs> I don't know anything about this. You know anybody who's he, who's been you know calling me at six thirty in the morning trying to ask me about this kind of thing. I don't know anything about this. I truly don't. But I. But it. But it does indicate that some people do yeah and if people don't know uh sarah used to co-host attack of the show uh back in the day and uh also used to work on attack of the show before it was changed to attack of the show uh when it was the screensavers which patrick norton you also used to go host uh so right. you know this is some history in the room i used to run the website over there at techtv.com before it became g4 so we all have like a, a passing interest in this but yeah, I don't I don't know anything in particular about this either. Although I am very close to a source at NBC Universal <laughs> when I uh, mentioned this, she's like, "Oh yeah, I heard about that last week." So you know, I actually and you know I won't call out anybody by name, but I I pinged some people this morning and I was like, "What is this? Why are all these people like paying me on Twitter about this?" And they were like, "Yeah, I know about it, but I'm under NDA." So mm -hmm. yeah, I was like. All right, cool, thanks. I mean, <laughs> way to leave me out of everything as usual. The best part is when we told Patrick this, and he and Patrick, what was your reaction? Who? Didn't they <laughs> close a long time ago? Yeah, no, I, I uh, yeah, it, the whole, it just makes no sense to me, but they own the brand and the URL, I Somebody guess. Does oh, it makes anyway. it yeah. Makes I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. Like, and video gaming is hot right now. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure somebody independent of this at NBC could have been thinking, like, you know, we should probably start a channel around video games. That that would be really hot. Uh, and somebody said, you know, we used to have one. And they're like, let's just revive the brand. We already got all the IP. So I you totally get it. G4.tv still redirects to Esquire. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, G4.tv does? Because G4TV.com has the Pong thing on it now. You're yeah. right, G4.tv goes to Esquire.com. Because if people don't know, G4TV was That's originally going to become the Esquire channel, and then they ditched that plan at one point. Yeah. Well, it was for some time, but yeah. Hmm. Well, yeah. there you go. Uh, TechCrunch's sources say Foxconn has begun building the iPhone 11 at its Chennai, India plant, though production yields are limited. India's Minister of Commerce and Industry also tweeted that Apple had begun assembling the iPhone 11 in India, so it seems like it's the case. Economic Times reports that Wistron also may begin making the new iPhone SE at its plant near Bengaluru as well. Uh, they used to make the old iPhone SE, uh, and so it would make sense for them to make the new one. Wistron began producing older models of iPhones back in 2017. It currently makes the iPhone XR there. In both cases, though, what's significant is this would be the first time that current iPhone models would be made in India. Uh, Indian factories have been putting out the less expensive older models up until now. The first big advantage in doing this is Apple could then sell its flagship phones without having to charge a 22% import duty, uh, which India puts on anything that isn't manufactured in the country. Xiaomi does this, saying nearly every phone it sells in India is assembled inside the country. So that alone would be enough for Apple to want this to happen. Uh, also, developing India as a manufacturing option hedges against the uncertainty caused by the trade and political conflicts between China and the United States. Uh, so I, I don't find uh, this news surprising, but it's notable that Apple's manufacturing base, as we have suspected, is beginning to widen. Well, I mean, this started a long time ago in Foxconn, you know, as soon as the 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 trade embargo started getting serious. Foxconn started making noises about expanding into India. So, uh, you know, this isn't real surprising. I think part of me is real curious what limited production yields actually means once it's translated out of PR well, speak. What, what it means right now is they're not making a lot of them yet, but it doesn't mo right. mean they won't tool up and start making a lot of them right. eventually. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what I mean is like 
are they saying that because it, it, I always when I, when I hear production yields, and of course I have Intel on the brain right now because of something later. But you <laughs> know, when yields are together. low, it means <laughs> things are broken. <laughs> and, right, uh, right. Or yeah, in, I, as you pointed out, maybe they're just slowly ramping things up. I that's so. how I took it. But you're right. Usually yield means like we just aren't able to get enough of them uh, to to work. I right. doubt that's what's going on here. It's probably just like man, we don't have because it's more expensive. We don't have as much demand inside India for the iPhone 11, so we don't have to make right. as many of them right away. According to internal documents seen by Android police, as of August 4th, T-Mobile will require new devices activated on its network to support voice over LTE. Existing 3G voice devices will now continue to work until uh, January of 2021, and T-Mobile confirmed that new devices on its network will require voice over LTE support but didn't offer the timeline. T-Mobile told The Verge that it has not offered non-voice over LTV devices for years, and the overwhelming majority of devices on its network support voice over LTE. AT&T will shut down its 3G calling service in 2023, and Verizon is shutting down 3G service at the end of this year. Yeah, everybody's making a bigger deal about this than I think they would have because of that AT&T email that we talked about previously this week where they kind of tried to scare people into upgrading their phone two years before they're ending uh, the 3G <laughs> calling service. What T-Mobile's trying to say is, look, we barely have anybody on the network who uses a voice over LTE phone or non-VOLTE phone. Right. Uh, and and the only ones that do are people who bring their own phones. So we're we're just letting them know, like, hey, if you bring your own phone, you better bring a newer phone because if you're bringing a three year old phone, it's not going to activate. And anybody who's still on the network in January whose phone is several years old probably ought to upgrade, too. But they're not sending out a scary email about it, at least not yet. Two security firms, Synactive and Grimm, have found that the Android version of the DJI Go 4 app, uh, that's the app you use with the quadcopters from DJI, has some suspicious behaviors, or at least these two researchers think so. The researchers say the app can download code outside of the Google Play Store, so not an up app update through the Google Play Store, but it can secretly download its own code and install, theoretically, anything it wants, any application it wants. Uh, in fact, it uses the Weibo uh, framework to do this, and Weibo allows for you to in download and install apps within Weibo because it's a super app. It's a platform. The researchers also found a function that they say could restart the app when the user closes it so that you wouldn't notice that it didn't stay closed, and then it would run in the background making network requests. All right, so those aren't great things. Uh, DJI says, yes, we have an app update function like that. We have to have that to guard against users hacking geofencing restrictions. The FAA in the United States requires restrictions on the app to say you can't fly into these particular areas, you can't go above this altitude. And if people try to hack the app to get around that, this function would automatically replace any code that a hacker would put in to put the geofencing back. That's what DJI is saying it's there for. DJI also says it can't replicate the restart function that the researchers are talking about. They're like, we don't we don't see that happening. DJI also says its functions were never exploited for malicious reasons. Uh, there's no evidence of that. The researchers say, yeah, no, we didn't see evidence of malicious use. We're just saying it could happen. DJI Go 4 for Android does, however, require access to your contacts, your microphone, your camera, your location, your storage, and the ability to change your network connectivity uh, so if it were to do something malicious, it would also have access to all that information too, which is unsettling. Google said it's going to look into all this. It's going to investigate these claims and get back to everybody. Patrick, are you a, a drone user and do these uh, findings uh, surprise or scare you? Um, no, uh, you know, we use smaller drones like the, you know, we have a, we have literally a couple of boxes of, uh, little simple drones. We've got one DJI. Um, I, I think this is that thin line between, I think this is malicious. We think this is, you know, safety. It, it's, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I'm torn between my usual level of paranoia involving anything. And sometimes, uh, you know, an unexploited mistake is not something to freak out about. I'm kind of curious to see, uh, you know, now that it's talked about <laughs> what people will be looking forward in the future. Um, you know, eh. 
I, I think one thing that made me feel a little better about this is uh, the researchers also found that the previous version of DJI Go 4 uh, was sending telemetry data to a web advertiser and that before this research was published, DJI went in and, and got rid of that, uh, which is that that's a typical app move these days is an app company thought it was okay to be sending all this data to an ad company and that's not popular anymore. So the company goes in and rips it out. DJI did that all on its own. Uh, I think that shows that they're not, you know, the, the, the princes and saints of the, of the universe here, but they're, they're right. in at least operating an industry norm, which is like, Oh, that's not cool anymore. Okay. We'll, we'll stop doing that. <laughs> it's not, Oh, you noticed that we're so sorry. Yeah. We'll, we'll clear that out. It doesn't uh, necessarily mean that they were like, had an evil plan, yeah. but you know, the Chinese company right now is going to get extra scrutiny. That's, that's understandable. Well, speaking of collecting information, <laughs> the information sources say that Google has an internal program called Android Lockbox that collects data on how non-Google apps are used on Android. The sources also say that Google uses this information to improve Google's own apps. So when people agree to share information while setting up Android, the program collects how often apps are opened and how long they're in use. So Google said in a statement that it uses the Android app data a API, usage data API, to access, quote, basic data about app usage, such as how often apps are opened, to analyze and improve services, end quote. Google also cited the adaptive battery feature and Play Store app discovery feature as ways it has used the data. I, I think the idea here is to to have a gotcha on Google similar to what people have accused Amazon of, which uh, the accusation with Amazon is that they look at what's selling with all the third party uh, marketers on the Amazon platform, then create a product based on that that drives those creators out of business. Right. So uh, a, a cool, uh, cool pattern on a shirt. Uh, is going crazy, and then Amazon makes their own pattern and puts that up in the search results, and that's anti-competitive behavior. That's the allegation. I think they're trying to say the same thing here, is that Google looks at what app behavior is on the Android platform and then would use that to make apps that uh, drive the other apps out. I feel like that's, that's a less compelling thing on Google, where, yeah, they do bundle their apps in, but you also do not have to use them, unlike iOS. You can, you can basically change to almost any other app on Android. Right. So without, you know, without requiring me to to use your app, it feel I mean, I guess you could still say, oh, well, we'll make our apps better than the other ones in the app store. But also it feels legitimate that you would just use the data in the API uh, to improve your operating system. But this is the problem when you run apps on your operating system and the operating system is it cast out and people go, well, wait a minute. Are you doing this just for the operating system? Or are you doing this to to you know, be better at competing with the other apps on your own platform. I almost feel like this could also be a security issue where, you know, uh, you could just observe, you know, is there a large group of behavior? Is something odd going on? You know, all of a sudden a whole bunch of people in a region download an application that nobody had ever heard of before is a legitimate application. I mean, it, there's, there's, it doesn't sound particularly nefarious to me, but I'm also not competing against you know google in yeah. the app space so if i was an app i would not like the idea of this uh, right. if i was making an app if i was an app i wouldn't be a human so i probably wouldn't have any feelings <laughs> <laughs> if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com tell you who's got some feelings right now people at intel let's be clear intel's earnings were good its processor arm saw revenue rise seven percent because laptops work from home people were buying a lot of those Data center and memory solutions helped drive an overall 20% year-over-year increase in revenue for Intel. Also, good news on the horizon, the 11th Gen Tiger Lake and Z graphics cards are coming to laptops later this year. They're highly anticipated. The company's first 10 nanometer desktop CPUs, 12th Gen Alder Lake, also coming by the end of this year. That's the good news. However, during the earnings report, Intel announced it is delaying it's seven nanometer CPUs for personal computers, six months, which would see the chips arrive sometime in 2022. Intel CEO Bob Swan said the company had identified what he called a defect mode in the seven nanometer process. Meanwhile, keep in mind, AMD has had its seven nanometer Ryzen 4000 chips on sale for a few months now. 
AWS makes its own seven nanometer graviton chip. The iPhone 11 uses a seven nanometer process made CPU made by TSMC. In fact, TSMC is readying its five nanometer process. So Intel is definitely behind and announcing a delay uh, doesn't make people happy. Also, the announcement was reminiscent of then Intel CEO Brian Kurzanich saying in 2015 that the 10 nanometer process was running behind schedule and would be delayed six to nine months. That's six month figure again. And as you heard, some of those 10 nanometer products are just now coming out. Current CEO Bob Swan also made a remark that if 10 nanometer delays continue, Intel might outsource manufacturing. Here's his quote. We're going to be pretty pragmatic about if and when we should be making stuff inside or making outside and making sure that we have optionality to build internally, mix and match inside and outside, or go outside in its entirety if we need to. That'd be a big de deal for Intel. They, they don't do that. Uh, Intel 7 nanometer Ponte Vecchio graphics chip, which is meant for data centers and meant to bring Intel into competition with NVIDIA in data centers, was identified as a chip that they might decide to be have made by outside chip factories. So the big thing here, Patrick, that has people concerned is the delay, right? Right. Um, let's, the, let's sort of break this down. You, you mentioned the, the 10 nanometer announcement from several years ago. Um, the, uh, the desktop CPUs, the first 10 nanometer desktop CPUs, uh, Alder Lake, are actually not going to come to the second half of 2021 not this year. Um, to put that into perspective, they were talking about 10 nanometers several years ago, and it's gotten delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. All the Intel desktop processors are still sitting at 14 nanometer. Did he say six months? He meant six years. <laughs> six decades. Um, but like, yeah, it's, when you, when you look at processors, um, you know, you, you come up with a design and, the process usually goes through a die shrink. Um, you know, when they change to a more efficient process, they shrink the size of everything. That reduces the voltage consumed. It gives you kind of a de facto reduction in the power consumed and a performance boost. And there's cooling. And that's what Intel's sort of TikTok thing was like for years, where they, you know, the new processor design, a die shrink, a new processor design, a die shrink. And they would kind of get two layers of fun out of every design. That gave them some breathing room. And Intel was for approximately forever the most advanced in terms of shrinking the process uh, or shrink, you know, go through die shrinks and, and updating the process. And the wheels have just kind of completely fallen off that in the last three or four years. And that has allowed, uh, you know, companies that, that are kind of dedicated to manufacturing other people's designs uh, to move to a lower process. Now you could argue that I want to say like TSMC seven nanometer is kind of like Intel's 10 nanometer, but the truth is, is Intel's, you know, still struggling with 10 nanometer. And the end result is, you know, things like when AMD was launching a processor last year and they decided to see how many times they could say seven uh, or put seven in the artwork and in, uh, you know, the 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 presentation and the speeches and the marketing because they were just driving a fork into Intel's rib cage because Intel wasn't even on 10 nanometer and they're at seven and we're at seven and we're at seven. We mentioned seven, seven. We're going to launch this on seven, set. you know what I mean? And, and it just went on and on. It's brutal. <laughs> um, so a lot of things going on at the high end, depending on who you ask in terms of market share, sort of the high end desktop, there's been huge gains by AMD. AMD has had, uh, I think, 10 consecutive quarters of gains against Intel in the overall PC market. They've just released a huge round of processors that are going to be just for OEMs. So they're losing market share. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of money, um, <laughs> you know, and, and they've gone from being, you know, for years and years and years, well, yeah, yeah, if you bought an AMD, it's because you were an AMD loyalist or because you were looking for a particular rock bottom processor. But in the last couple of years, uh, AMD, you know, they've done phenomenal work. The performance is way up. Um, we could argue about individual, you know, single core performance, but the reality is, is AMD is doing some incredible stuff with their architectures and they are really in a position, especially with mobile to start digging away at Intel's uh, core business because client computing is like, you know, I still want to say at least still 30% of their, or almost 30, 40, 50% of their business. It's a lot of money. 
Yeah. Um, you know, they, they have a huge amount in the data center group and other stuff, but um, Intel's got a real problem. And for, you know, Intel's leadership to come out and say, it might be time for us to move to someone else. Um, that's e either some kind of a really vicious um, challenge to the engineers at Intel to fix this problem, uh, or it's just them, you know, acknowledging that they, after, you know, all of the time they were leading on this, they have sort of lost their way and they are going to move to other options moving forward, which, you know, is interesting. It's a big change for Intel. Uh, and in terms of Intel's culture, it's an incredible change. Well, if you look at the the history of Intel, uh, it's it's lately been a history of missing opportunities and relying yeah. on its x86 uh, instruction set chips uh, to carry the weight. And that's the bad news here is AMD and others are coming for that in various ways. Uh, and if that's all you've got, that's not enough to carry you forward. Right. The fact of the matter is it's not all they've got. They've got data center. And in fact, that's where most of their growth came from. Uh, and they could retreat into that. But that's, again, like giving up yeah. one more market. Uh, I think it would make sense for them to say, well, look, uh, desktop CPUs, not a growth market. Uh, we could abandon that and and go into other designs. And maybe that's what's leading Bob Swan to say, maybe it's a little of both. Maybe it's both a challenge to the engineers, but also a way forward to say, look, engineers, if you can make seven nanometer work and get us back on track, right. great, we'll stay there. But if you can't, uh, it's time for an IBM-like pivot where we stop making typewriters and start making mainframes. We stop <laughs> building chips and we go to designing them and designing controllers for Thunderbolt and, and data center stuff and become more of an enterprise level company and less of a supplier for, for personal computers. Right. Um, you know, and there's no doubt that, that Intel is still making huge amounts of money, period. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I, you know, I think it's been kind of crazy. I mean, one, there's this huge reaction from Wall Street uh, who punished in no, no uncertain terms. Wall Street just punished Intel's stock price. Uh, AMD is now worth more per share, but the market value is so much huger by Intel. Uh, but the other thing is you touched on it before is, is they missed some opportunities and you know, ARM processors and cell phones have become the primary, you know, it's the primary, it's the, it's the primary computer for the vast majority of people on the planet. You know, they're never going to have a laptop, they're never going to have a desktop, or, or it will be a long time before they have a, a laptop or a desktop. So the computer is where they interact with the internet and each other, the web and games. And, um, you know, that was a huge opportunity that just kind of slid right by Intel. And by the time Intel realized that that you know, AMD powered devices primarily uh, coming from uh, or primarily running Android, we're going to kind of kind of take over the universe. You know, they they were like, okay, we're going to do mobile, and they did this huge thing to try to do mobile, and it didn't really work. And then this huge thing to try to do Internet of Things, and it didn't really work. So um, they're frustrated because in terms of of volume, uh, AMD's kind of taken over computing, and they're you know, AMD's also made huge inroads in. Um, the data centers. So they have to be a little uptight about looking at that, especially with, I think you guys talked about it yesterday, you know, with NVIDIA thinking mm -hmm. about buying AMD from SoftBank, that would be... Arm, buying ARM from SoftBank. Sorry, ARM. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've made that yeah. mistake. <laughs> we all have. Yeah. I have AMD on the brain. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, if NVIDIA buys uh, ARM from SoftBank, that, that's, that becomes, that, I think at that point, it becomes a real vicious NVIDIA versus Intel battle for data centers and, 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 uh, and AI and all sorts of stuff moving forward. Um, so, so what you're saying is, uh, it's, you know, indicating that either you get back on track or becoming, uh, a designer rather than a maker of chips is in, right. in a sense, Intel swan song. Yes. Question mark. Um, well, no, because but, Bob Swan is saying it, so uh, it definitely, it, was, it really is. It just slid right by me. <laughs> um, I apologize. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, no, it's, it's, but it's, it's a challenge, and it's a huge, uh, it's just a huge cultural shift at Intel. The idea that Intel would be manufacturing oh, yeah. processors. Uh, yeah. That's it's Titanic. You know, yeah, yeah. And just, just throwing uh, that out is that's. That's meaningful, even if they never do it. Just saying yeah. that on an earnings call, that's that's serious stuff. You don't you yeah. don't just say that by accident. That's not a throwaway. I mean, the other thing that struck me is because I, I had cut and pasted this and sent it to a friend of mine is, um, you know, 
the quote from from Bob Swan, you know, we've root caused the issue. We believe there are no fundamental roadblocks. OK, that's that's OK. Yeah. And then the next sentence, I think, was, quote, but we've also invested in contingency plans to hedge against further schedule uncertainty. We've mitigated the impact of the process laying our product schedule by leveraging improvements in design methodology, such as diet disaggregation and advanced packaging. And it's like that's a lot of, you know jargon <laughs> and, and that's a lot of non-financial jargon in an earnings you know report like that's you know contingency plan that's that's a huge statement uh, and i think uh, honestly what you're talking if he's talking about moving over to another manufacturer that's a huge contingency fan they also have a contingency plan they also have enough money where they could flat out pay uh any of a number of manufacturers a staggering amount of money to kind of set up manufacturing for their use. Uh, and I wouldn't, you know, that may be a much smarter utilization of resources for Intel. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, if you have thoughts on this, you can always join the conversation in our discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. We also want to take a moment to shout out our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Scott Hepburn, Dan Colbeck and Erwin Stir. <laughs> Len Peralta has been busy drawing today. What have you drawn from today's show, Len? Well, you know, I know Intel's problems aren't necessarily <laughs> pandemic focused, but I, you know, <laughs> for this, I sort of did that. Uh, this is called Chip Insecurity, this piece. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, you've heard of food insecurity. It's the same sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> when it deals with tech stuff, it's a little bit different. Uh, you have a gentleman saying uh, it's, Intel's chips are delayed till at least 2022. And the dudes who are eating this thing called Chippos is saying, 2022, how will they get any work done without these sweet, delicious chips? So... Yeah. Chippos. Chippos. <laughs> exactly. Chippos. <laughs> this is, if you're interested in taking a look at this, this is at my Patreon right now, patreon.com forward slash Len. Or if you want to purchase it, you can go to lenperaltastore.com. Excellent. Also, thanks to Patrick Norton for being with us today. Patrick, I know you're on the move. Um, you're doing lots of stuff. <laughs> Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. You know, uh, just recorded another episode of AVXL with Robert Heron uh, yesterday. And uh, hopefully there will be a uh, our first episode of This Week in Computer Hardware. Uh, Sebastian Peek and I are recording one on Monday. Oh, cool. Hopefully that'll be back online next week. Very I cool. Think. So let's. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everybody. Who, <laughs> thank you, everybody who supports our show. Patreon.com slash DTNS. It's the best way to support DTNS. Also, uh, another way is uh, to buy some stuff in our store. We got hoodies. We got coffee mugs. Uh, we got stickers. We have masks. If you need any of that stuff with DTNS logo on it, go check it out. Support the show at DailyTechNewsShow.com slash store. And if you have feedback, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday. If you haven't joined us live, please do. 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Uh, this week at Computer Hardware is back. And on Monday, Andy Anatko is here. It feels like old times. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>